eight. We're back. We're live. <laughs> two o'clock rock. <laughs> Think Tech Hawaii. Likeable science every Friday, two o'clock. And we have our likable scientist here, Ethan Allen. Right, right. Hi, Ethan. Right, right. <laughs> nice to be here again. Yeah, let's, uh, today's uh, show is entitled Drilling Down on CRISPR. <laughs> and uh, that's not a breakfast cereal at all. <laughs> um, so we should, we should define it. Uh, we should understand it better. Uh, we should understand the incredible, you know, uh, discovery involved in CRISPR, and then we should talk about where is it going and what are the problems, because we know that really powerful technologies, especially in, in biochemistry, um, have their problems, yeah. Right, right, absolutely. So what does it stand for, CRISPR? C-R-I-S-P-R. So, so it's a clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. And what that really means <laughs> is, if you, if you think about it, you've got to sort of go back a little step back into the, the sort of the biochemistry of, of our genes and our chromosomes. Your chromosomes contain all the instructions to build you, right? Every cell in your body has the complete instructions to build you. Every living every, every, organism yes, has this. Complete yeah. instructions, each cell in every living organism. That it is one single molecule that is several feet long, if it were stretched out, it lives inside each, each and every cell in your body. And it's just basically a series of little individual units that are read off in groups of three, typically, to make sort of letters of an alphabet that then spell out. And, and the part of it that we're most familiar with are the genes, which are se segments that tell the body how to build proteins, because proteins really run a lot of our show, basically. They have structure, they run processes. And way back when, eons ago, some clever little single-celled organisms discovered that if they, if they had this CRISPR stuff, the, the, these clusters of regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, they could use these to cut DNA, to slice the DNA strand. And that's a useful thing to do if you've been invaded by a foreign being, if you can go and cut their DNA in half. Uh, it's it's, it's sort of part of the immune system yeah, then. It, exactly, it sort of slows them down and all. And the beauty of this is it, it's a new technology that we've discovered that, that you can cut DNA very precisely. If, if you want to cut it at one specific point, you can set up a CRISPR system that will find that point on any DNA strand and cut right there at that one point. At the gene. Yes, yeah, so you can, you can cut out a particular gene. You can, using other sort of versions of CRISPR, insert a new gene in its place. Even more powerfully, it, you know, we think of genes as really being like really important, but we really only have, what, 21,000, 23,000 genes. I mean, it's not, not really m many. The power of the genes is that they are regulated by these flanking sequences. So lots and lots of this long strand of, of a chromosome isn't genes at all, only a little bit of it really is genes. But a lot of the rest of so-called junk DNA for a long time runs those genes and sort of says, turn on now, turn off now. Uh, express yourself more now, express yourself less. And if you think about it, you've got to run that, right? Think of, think of a little plant growing, right? A rose bush, say. It starts out, what does it got to do? It's got to put up some stems, it's got to put up some roots, and it's got to put up some leaves. But every cell in the rose bush knows how to make a rose bud and open up into a rose flower. But you don't want to do that first, right? <laughs> when your little sprout is high, you know, putting out a rose flower will be useless, will be worse than useless, it will be deadly. You never survive. <laughs> right, right. You've got to wait until you've grown up and you're several years old and you've got leaves and roots and stems. Right. And right. Then those genes can get turned on. Something has to tell those genes, okay, now it's time to start making flowers, you know? And that's sort of really the power of CRISPR is you, you can tell genes when to turn on and off. Um, you can not only just cut them out entirely, but you can actually control them in, very, in a very fine-tuned way. Oh, this, you know, this sounds like computer programming. It, it, very much, it very much is. It's sort of the coding, basically, the underlying coding of the whole yeah, yeah, of, of yeah, our whole yeah. genomics. You have the underlying coding, the un underlying intelligence, the controlling mechanism, right. and then you have the functions that actually do things. Right. And so it's a, it's a layered arrangement. Right. right? In, in a sense, it's as if you could be driving your car down the road and not just have an accelerator, but you could, for instance, change the size of, of the, the pistons and cylinders and, and adjust the gap on your spark plugs and adjust the, the fuel mix all while you're driving down the road. In a sense, it's that level of control. You know, you could change your car from being a pickup truck to an XK Jag 
you know, while you're driving, basically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's sort of that kind of thing. Well, to me, one point you mentioned that I think is very important is uh, we used to think that the strands, the chromosome strands on which the, uh, the genes were laid um, were junk, what do you call them, junk DNA. Much, much was thought to be junk DNA. Junk DNA, but now we may not feel right. that way. Now, now, now they're yeah, smart, like, smarter than we thought. There's repressors, enhancers, promoters. All, we've recognized these, all these other little sections that flank the genes are doing actually important work with the genes, yeah. although they are, themselves aren't coding for proteins. They're not junk at all. No, no, no. Yeah. They are, they are, they are the, the fine-tuned mechanisms, you know. So can we talk about the, you know, the, the biochemistry of it? Sure. What is in a chromosome? So as, as I recall, there's 48 chromosomes in a, in a human being? Uh, something like Whatever, that. Whatever, something like that. Things. And the genes yeah. are on the chromosomes. They're, they're parts of the chromosome. Part of the, right. okay. You, and you can look at it, the strand, and you can see every so, every so often you see a gene. Um, uh, and genes come in, in pairs, don't they? Well, the chromosomes typically are two, are two strands wrapped around each other, yes. Okay, right. okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> what, what is it biochemically that we're looking at when we look at this chromosome that's, what, this, this long? Right, right. So it, it is basically, it's one big DNA molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid. So it is a, a molecule with a bunch of little sort of ribose sugars units held together in a spiral pattern with these, these little... The helix. Yes, double helix, so-called, right. And it's basically, it has four kinds of units on it, adenine, cysteine, guanine, and... Say, say that again, the four units. Uh, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cysteine, I think. Okay. Uh, if I'm not All right. Th those are the elements uh, on the, right. on the, th those the are DNA, the molecule. Yes, you're right. Exactly. Those little so-called deoxyribose sugar units, basically. Okay. And that four-letter code basically gets uh, translated into uh, eventually into amino acids, and then eventually from amino acids they get built into proteins, and that's, that's how, we, how we run the whole thing. So it's chemical. Oh, yeah. The whole thing is, 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 is modern, right. sophisticated chemistry. Right, but it's all being read linearly. So that whole DNA strand gets, gets there's a little, literally a, a little molecular machine that runs along that, reading that, and, and dumping out appropriate uh, all results. within one molecule. Yeah, runs that whole mo many, many feet of molecule. So the, it, the parts of the molecule, which is really tiny, to talk to each other. Right. Or some parts control other parts. It turns out, yes, it turns out DNA it doesn't just squash itself into a messy ball in the middle of your uh, nucleus. It actually folds in a very controlled pattern. Uh, they're just now beginning to understand how, how how its own structure helps it fold in the right kind of way, so the right parts are near the right other parts. When you say fold, you mean a physical fold. Yes. It folds on itself. Right. So it's not, it's, it's not naturally <laughs> it, like that. It can't it's be folded that up because it's really tight. It's, yeah. it's, it's inside a cell. It's, so you know. so distinguish also for me the difference between a molecule and an atom. I mean, if I'm, if I'm at the molecular level, can I see the atoms? Uh, how much smaller are they, and uh, how do they form up to be the molecule? So the atoms are... Uh, measured and molecules are measured in a scale called, typically called nanometers. Now, nanometers comes from the word nano is from the Greek nanos, dwarf. And Which and means? A, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. Okay. Now, that doesn't sound, you, can't, you may have trouble, gr trouble grasping it. The analogy I like to use is your fingernails. They grow. You know your fingernails grow, right? You have to file them occasionally. A nanometer is the amount that your fingernails grow in one second. That's not much. Not much at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, a nanometer is very tiny. Okay, okay. And most atoms are, you can measure an atom in uh, as a, roughly a nanometer, a couple nanometer size, depending upon the atom. Molecules are a few nanometers in size sometimes. You know. So, I mean, it's all, you're talking tiny, tiny stuff. That's why a strand of it, three feet long, can pack into such a tiny thing as a cell that's only, you know, Literally a, so, a few thousand nanometers. The molecule is composed of atoms. Yes. But it's it's um, complex. There's a lot of atoms in a molecule. There, not, there, there not can be. I mean, well, you know, there's very simple atoms like oxygen. I mean, molecules like the oxygen molecule. There's just two oxygen atoms stuck together. Things like water. The DNA is not simple. No, no. DNA is a, is a very complex molecule. And it would be bigger, I suppose, yes. than oxygen. Yes. Again, a, a single strand of DNA could be stretched out to several feet long. And that wouldn't be the case with oxygen. Be, no, no. It wouldn't be that long. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, and now now uh, let's talk about genes for a minute so okay. we get the picture complete. Okay. Now, so we every so often um, on the strand of um, the DNA molecule, uh, the chromosome, right? Um, we have we have genes. Right, and, and that's they're just a section of just the same kind of stuff that's already there. Yeah. It's just that particular section basically is a is an instruction book that says build this kind of protein, build this particular enzyme, you know. What, whatever it may be. Do they look different under a microscope? Uh, no, you can't how, how can you tell when you're, as you're moving up and down this, this strand of chromosome, how can you tell you're at a, a gene rather than in the, call it the junk, the, the junk DNA part of the chromosome? You really couldn't looking at the DNA molecule. Uh, it, it's sort of, it, it's the output from the, the little machine as it were that runs up and down and reads it out, basically just starts because of that particular sequence of letters, as it were, it spells out a meaningful word or builds a protein in this case. Uh, and then the next part doesn't actually do that. Yeah. Uh, it makes odd little other things that turn out to be very important to how that protein may work, but it's not, not actually building the protein. You know, they had a program on 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago about um, Colombia, the, the country of Colombia in South mm -hmm. America, where there are a remarkable high percentage of people who have, al have Alzheimer's. And uh, this was valuable from a scientific point of view because then they could look at the genetic makeup of these people mm -hmm. and see what is, you know, what it is about them as opposed to people elsewhere, right. and find out what, you know, what, 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 what is it with Alzheimer's? How does it express itself in the genetic makeup? And they, and they found there was one gene. Uh, this isn't, you know, beyond further laboratory testing, but uh, they need to test it. But they found one gene that was common in all of them and came to believe that, uh, with certain scientific confidence, um, that that gene was responsible for the Alzheimer's. Oh, interesting, I, I and, had not heard this. And they this. had, you know, some graphics, that, mm -hmm. if not photographs through the microscope, must have been an atomic microscope, mm -hmm. right, to see th exactly what the gene, <coughs> what the gene looked like mm -hmm. on the, <coughs> the strand of chromosome, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, I found was very interesting because, and I'm sure we'll go into this in the second part of the show, because if they could fix that gene, mm -hmm. then logically, uh, you wouldn't have propensity toward Alzheimer's right. anymore. And that's exactly what CRISPR gives them the ability to do, is to take a particular gene literally and snip it out and then stick a new version that's correct in oh, its place. Oh, this is getting more exciting yeah. every minute. Yeah. And speaking of minutes, we're going to take a, a nano minute here. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a short I've already taken it. Really? Aloha, Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, and I'm inviting you to navigate the journey. We are discussing the end of life options and we would really love to have you every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. right here. Feliz Navidad. Happy holidays Feliz and Merry Navidad. Christmas from Hibachi Talk. And all of us Feliz here at Think Tank Hawaii. Aloha, how you doing? Welcome to Hibachi Talk. Gordo de Texar here. We're here every Friday from 1 o'clock till about 1.45, and we talk tech with many, many great guests. So I got uh, Andrew, the security guy, who helps me co-host, and I got Poppy Chulo, who comes in once in a while to, to help us through the show. So please come join Hibachi Talk every Friday. Angus will be here, too. So remember, like we say at the end of every show, how you doing? Okay, I'm Jay Pidell. I'm here with Ethan Allen, our likable scientist on likable science. And we're talking about CRISPR. It's not the first time we've talked about CRISPR, and it certainly will not be the last. This is revolutionary science. We're talking about how it works, and talking about how we can use it to make life better, mm -hmm. or at least different. So let's talk about exactly what you would do with CRISPR to fix, for example, the Alzheimer's gene. So if, if you identified a particular gene that was associated with Al Alzheimer's, you could arrange, in theory, through CRISPR, uh, in an embryo, you would test and see if, if, that, if they had that gene. And in that embryo, then you would basically run your CRISPR technology, find that gene, literally snip it out and stick back in its place a correct version of the gene. It's not gonna give you Alzheimer's. Okay, stop there for a minute. So you actually cut 
Right. The the chromosome. Right. Um, it's like a film, like a like a yep. celluloid film. film. You cut that part out and then splice it back together. And then you you find a a good gene. Right. Um, say an Alzheimer's uh, or a oh, gene no. that doesn't have the defect of right. this Alzheimer's gene right. and then uh, you hold the two ends of the film like splicing <laughs> a film and you put the the, the better uh, gene back in that same right. spot um, and now you have a chromosome yeah. with, with, with a better gene and yeah. no, no, presumably no Alzheimer's. Right. Now, as you can imagine, there are, it's not quite as simple as it sounds. <laughs> well, let's drill down. How, okay. how do you do that? Well, uh, it was actually, there was a, f a very funny article in Science recently where uh, this reporter was, was writing this whole article on the use of CRISPR because it's been a huge thing in the, in the mouse lab business because now you can, you can generate lines of mice with all these different genetic mutations very quickly and very precisely. And people say about CRISPR, oh, it's so easy, an idiot can do it. And so this reporter said, well, I'm going to try this. <laughs> <laughs> And he sat down and was taken through the process by a scientist who does a lot of this. And his version of the experiment did not actually work. The scientist guiding him was sort of doing the same experiment in parallel, and his did work. Uh, it is just really, it's sort of a cut and paste kind of thing. You, you, you pick up certain bits and pieces, follow what, some what little are, recipes. What equipment do you use to do this? It, it's very sort of, very simple stuff. You're literally pipetting solutions back and forth and, and moving cells around. I mean, it's, it, there's nothing very elaborate It's all about under it. a microscope, huh? Yeah, it's done a lot of it, with, not even the microscope. A lot of it's just you're, you're doing this with, with fluids, basically, full of vials of fluids and moving stuff around. I mean, it, it's, that's the thing. It, it really is, it's sort of cookbook, sort of simple stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's, there are subtleties to it, you know, but... Uh, okay, so I have my chromosome. And I have this gene which I'm suspicious of. Right. Cut the gene out, take it away, put a new, better one. Where do we get the better one from exactly? To get it from uh, some other person? Yeah, you, you, you built a, another you, organism, you know, right? Or you built it yourself? And and oh, you built it yourself? Yeah. yeah. So uh, can it, I buy I, that at uh, yeah, at Tandy? A, maybe at Radio Shack? That's is just about what it's almost is like going out to yeah, to like a Home Depot, mm -hmm. and except it's like you Depot. It's you know. scary. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're beginning to make these kind of things that you can just buy off the shelf now and, and stick in. Uh, that reminds me of drones, you know. <laughs> Anybody can have a drone that can be made lethal. Right. Mm -hmm. Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you, 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 you put in another gene that you got or made or mm, scary, and then you sew it up. How do you sew it up? Does it sew up by itself? It basically does. Actually, the, all CRISPR really does is sort of take things apart and sets it up so that normal, the normal... DNA repair mechanisms will work. Ah, so it's... DNA it's, has a tendency to want to repair itself. And it's alive, right? It's, well, it's, it's, would you say that DNA is a living living organism? I would not, but that's that's where you get into this funny thing, our, our virus is alive, you know. A, a virus particle is basically just RNA or DNA wrapped in a protein coat. Yeah. And when it sits there like that, it basically isn't alive. It's not metabolizing, it's not doing anything. Only when it comes in contact with a proper host, then it links onto that host, it shoots its DNA into the host, uses the host's mechanisms to start reproducing its own so DNA. you can't say it's alive, but, but, it's, but it's not dead either. It's a symbiotic kind it, of thing. It's a, yeah, and some obligate it's symbiote, yeah, right. So in the case of, but you don't need that for the DNA molecule we're talking about. Right, right. Um, so let's assume it's not alive, and it, it can, you can do this without a host, right? You can do this with that just DNA, single right. strand. No, yeah. um, and it, uh, the properties of it, the biochemical properties, will heal, heal the cut. You, it and now it will become not, one. Not, not always perfectly is one of the problems. Uh, Sometimes like an extra amino acid will get in, in the, the middle of it, or an extra, an extra ribose sugar. Screw it up. And then, yes, your whole reading frame is now thrown off. Which, which could give you a completely unpredicted result. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, Probably not may, good. Maybe a bad, <laughs> bad result. The other thing is, and I, you know, this is a question I, I always forget to ask when we get in these conversations. So congratulations, Ethan. You have spliced one gene on one DNA chromosome. That's mm -hmm. great. But I have about 27 billion <laughs> <laughs> DNA molecules in my body. Right. How does it get from the one, if at all, to the other. Well, what you, the, one of the things you want to typically do, and, and it's, it's often done, uh, for instance, in breeding the, the mice that I was talking about earlier, you, you do this in an embryo, and once you put that in, when that cell, you put it in a cell that's going to divide many, many times, now that cell has the, the desired proper sequence in it, 
that sequence is just okay. repeated and repeated and repeated. So in an embryonic situation, right. it's easy because you know right. there's going to be cell splitting. Right, right. And it's going to multiply right. logarithmically. But in an ordinary, right. sitting so, here, you know, so, at the table, it's not going to happen. Right. So in the, in the human tests, they have actually have recently done CRISPR now in, over in China with uh, some people, uh, some person with very advanced incurable lung cancer. And they basically pulled some of their own cells out. They disabled, loudly enough, they disabled the gene. That, that, and this gene usually sort of tamps down the cell's immune response. And well, then they, they, well, what, what is it, it, it tamps down the immune response. You, you don't want, your, your whole immune system needs to run at some level. It can't be too active. If it's too active, it's going to react against your own cells. Reject perhaps. everything. Yeah, yeah, it hurt, attack everything. Your, your yeah. own cells, harmless things that are but floating around. But you don't around. want to be too passive. Either. You don't want to be too, too passive. And one of the things cancer cells take advantage of, at least certain kinds of lung cancer, is they help keep uh, your immune cells passive, basically, and so that your immune cells don't fight the cancer. With, th they help turn, turn down, tamp down that cell. So you take that gene that has been tamped down and basically, as it were, click it to an always on position where it's always maximally on now. Sound like computer programming and, again. And then essentially clone that cell over and over and over and over and then inject a bunch of these cells back in around the tumor. Okay, so now you have a certain number of cells, it's a finite number of cells that you have managed to replicate right. in a laboratory setting right. Right. and you insert them, you inject them into the area of the tumor, tumor. in this one Chinese uh, right. investigation. Right. Um, but that's it. They're not going to further proliferate. They're just going to stay there and they're going to presumably have some effect on the cells in that area, but they're not going to re replicate themselves. I, I suspect, and I don't know all the details, I suspect these cells actually do divide mm. and, they, and continue to divide. Mm. Uh, and basically, now you've got an, an army of cells that basically won't be turned off and tamped down by the cancer and should attack the cancerous cells and kill them. Well, it just seems to me, just sitting talking with you, you can program a cell to replicate itself. Well, you can make a cell I, think it's in an embryo. Many, many, yes, you can. Many of your cells do. I mean, your skin is always growing, yeah. your liver is always re replacing itself. So you can so, teach the new cell that you fixed right. to sort of become many cells. Yeah. The problem, of course, is now if you think about it, this individual, let's, let's say those cells go in and chew up all the cancerous cells, and, but what's now going to turn them off? They're, they're, now you've got this sort of hyperactive immune system which tends to reject things. Right, and it may start having some bad effects. Now, in this case, this person has terminal lung cancer and got no nothing, matter. No, nothing to lose. If they get rid of the lung cancer, they, yeah. they gained a lot. And yeah. even if they have problems down the road, yeah. hey, you know, yeah. that's so, too bad. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. you know, and again, this is just, what's but, really amazing about this is that four years ago, this was a technique that was known to a handful of scientists People, nobody had heard of it. It wasn't. There was no thought of it being used. And here, four, in four years, they've moved this from this really obscure little sort of laboratory science into something that's being tested on people. On people. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing is just a footnote: is that in China they did it before we did it in the U.S. because right. we have the FDA to deal with, yes. and they're not going to approve that until they're good and ready. Yeah. And, and in effect, and, and the Chinese probably will figure out how to tamp them down, tamp them up adjust mm -hmm. them before, during, and after their engagement with the cancer cell mm -hmm. so that you can come out without side effects and, and be healthy, right. um, which could be, knock wood, which could be the cure to cancer. Right. And that's why they're doing it, I am sure. Right. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah, you got to give them credit. Right. There's, there's a whole issue uh, of what they call conditional knockouts where you, you want to be able to turn off a gene or turn on a gene only under certain conditions. And when you either put another chemical or in the vicinity or shine a particular wavelength of light on or something, yeah, yeah. you have a switch that basically yeah. kicks it's it on It's a computer off. program. Yeah. It's yeah. an if-then statement or a case statement, yeah. just like, yeah. and you can program them to do that. Yeah. And you can program them to, them to split and, right. and, and proliferate. And well, you know, my, my old uh, boss, Leroy Hood, uh, used to say, you I know, remember that. I met him. I told you that. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah. And he said, biology is fundamentally information science. I yeah. mean, that's, that's what He's it is. Right about it. It. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 well, I mean, you know, I mean, it sounds very promising. Do you have any sense of um, what is happening in this country and uh, what other, you know, advances are being made using CRISPR? And uh, we don't have time for a complete discussion, but I'm just interested in your thought about that because I think we should come back to this again and again. It's not as if we're 
rehashing old stuff because this is moving so fast right. that we could discuss it every so often and always have new material to deal with. Exactly. So, you know, in a few months, they're doing, going to be doing another larger scale trial in China on more people. Probably, I'm guessing, probably by the end of 2017, we'll start some very preliminary tests in the U.S. because we, everyone sees that there's a great deal of potential in this technology to, to do a lot of good for people if, if, if we can sort of get a hold of it and, and know what to do. But you don't have to have a rich imagination to figure out how we could do bad, too. You can splice a gene the wrong way. You can splice right. a gene to have some really profound negative effect on a, on a given organism, mm -hmm. and then you can, have, you can splice the gene, splice the whole DNA strand to, uh, to replicate, mm -hmm. and then you can have it replicate quickly, because mm -hmm. that's all within the programming here, right. uh, and then effectively kill large populations with it. Mm -hmm. So it's very scary, and he who controls CRISPR now will control much more in the future. Yeah, I mean, it is one of the so-called dual-use technologies. Ah, thank uh, you. Uh, so, so many things are, right? I mean, yeah, they, they so can be used are. for good, they can be used for ill, yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, how, that's getting to be an increasingly recognized problem, is how do you deal with, with these? As, as the, there are more and more of such technologies, and they're more and more sophisticated, but they're also getting sort of more widespread and easier to use. And I mean, that's the, the real thing about CRISPR. It doesn't take a really big, fancy lab. It doesn't take you know, a gazillion dollars worth of equipment. You know, you, you can do it with stuff. You can buy a sure. standard commercial firm. You could set up in the studio, probably, a, a lab sure. and start doing CRISPR technology. Yeah, it's, it's like know. hacking. What does it yeah. take to get into hacking? Right, Not right. much. Yeah. The hacking programs you can buy on the internet right. are free, mostly. <laughs> anyway, I mean, the point, the point is that, you know, the answer to your question is nobody's watching. Well, and it has a life of its own, and we have to learn to watch and, and learn to monitor it and learn to be smarter than the next they, guy. They are watching. People, people are getting together and, and thinking about these and discussing these very issues. I mean, years ago when recombinant DNA first came out, there was the big Asilomar conference. They brought together scientists, philosophers, theologians, lawyers, everyone, and sort of had them sit and say, look, this recombinant DNA has potential to do real bad things if we just let it go, you know. But we can't, we can't stop it. It's basically sort of a Pandora's box kind of thing. It's, it's been opened. What do we do? How do we regulate it? How do we control it as best we can? Okay. And that's, we're going to leave it there. Yeah. That's uh, Ethan Allen. He's likable. He's a likable scientist. This is on Likable Science here on Think Tech uh, every Friday at 2, at 2 p.m. Come back soon and we'll talk some more about CRISPR and many other technologies you need to know about. Aloha. <laughs>